can just uh, excellent thanks then we can start with so do you guys Everett. want me to start or I'll wait yeah I would highly appreciate if you could start now um, with with your talk and then yeah, we can I can do that. reschedule okay thanks so first up so <laughs> Stevan. I can, I... Yeah. yeah no problem um, you can share your screen yes I will at least Good. Um, excellent. The stage is yours. It's fine. I can see. Yep. I can start if you want. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. So as uh, probably some of you know, I'm uh, part of the Wyogen group. Uh, I'm uh, into the aquaculture session, aquaculture uh, group with a few of our colleagues, uh, Prober, Caroline, Stephanie, from, uh, Stephanie and, and Caroline are from Kenya and Prober from Madagascar. So today I'm going to present uh, a representation on the role of aquaculture for food security, job creation, and poverty alleviation in the Western Indian Ocean region. And we'll look into some recommendation on policy to decision makers for economic growth. Uh, yep, yeah, it is. Okay. So the methodology, methodology we have used is basically a review of some of the uh, already published uh, recent publication on the topics. There have been few uh, publication of the topics in the region. But our study will mainly focus on the three countries, Madagascar, Mauritius, and Kenya. And we've chosen these three countries because Mauritius is a small island development state. Kenya is from the continent and Madagascar is a large island. And uh, we are looking at four main questions. So how aquaculture will contribute in addressing the issue of food security, unemployment, and poverty alleviation? What are the main uh, obstacles that hinder the development of aquaculture? What are the main opportunities for aquaculture development in the region? And some of the recommendations for decision makers. So I think uh, first thing we should probably, uh, should probably do is to define food security. So food security is achieved when all people at all times have physical and economic access to adequate and sufficient safe and nutritious food to meet the di dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So I have put down here some uh, parameters on, on the three different countries, um, parameters some indicators I've, I've uh, gathered from FAO, World Bank and SADC. Uh, so just to see the different, uh, uh, the three different countries, as you see Mauritius is very tiny compared to the two of us. Um, but however, Mauritius share the, the biggest uh, ocean territory, the EZ, which is 2.3 million square kilometer. We are, we are dealing with three different countries of different income group. You know, Madagascar is very low income. Mauritius is upper middle since 2021. Due to COVID, we have downgraded a bit. And, and uh, Kenya is considered as lower middle uh, income countries. So as you will see, here, the aquaculture production in 2008 and fisheries are uh, as follows. And I just highlighted the motion one because we see the big, big gap between uh, capture fisheries, what we are producing, and what we are basically consuming. And which shows indicate that we have a trade deficit and we are really, really dependent on uh, importation of food. I've also found some data on the contribution of uh, food fish to local diet. As an island, Mauritius is 23.6, uh, sorry, contribution, it's not percentage, sorry, there's a mistake here, so percentage is kilo per, per capita. Madagascar is still at 4.2 and Kenya is seven. It's not very uh, uncommon for island countries to be very dependent on uh, ocean resources as food. And, uh, the FAO uh, and, and, and World Health Organization uh, recommend that uh, 
in 2025, we should reach around 19 kilo per capita. And to achieve this, we'll see Madagascar that uh, there's a need for a significant increase in fish supply, around 27%. And uh, to reach, uh, 27% is to reach the actual 4.2 kilo. But to reach the 19 recommended one, there's, there's a need for 405% increase in the supply. Mauritius, we already reached above 19 kilo, and I couldn't find, uh, sorry, I couldn't find data for Kenya. So let's see, I'm going to uh, go forward three different countries. Let's see how uh, aquaculture is contributing or can contribute to uh, uh, food security and job creation. This one is Madagascar. Madagascar globally, internationally, globally, food insecurity affects around 800 million people. For Madagascar, 42% of children under five are affected by malnutrition. And in the last few years, uh, in the southern part of the island, one part six inhabitants are suffering from famine due to drought and, uh, and caused by climate change. In the fishery sector, the fishing and aquaculture, fishing and aquaculture uh, contributes to around 6% of Madagascar GDP, but there's a potential of going up to 200,000 uh, 200, tons per year in terms of production, employ around 100,000 people are involved in this uh, fishery sector, and 1.5% are directly dependent on the fishery sec uh, sector. The situation like it is in many countries in the region, there is a situation of overfishing, mainly in the coastal, uh, and uh, most of our small scale fisheries are facing uh, over, -exploit over exploitation of uh, fishery stock. So in Madagascar, some of the farm species are shrimp, sea cucumber, seaweed, crabs, shellfish, and, uh, and spirulina. The factors that hinder mariculture development in Madagascar, the first one is disease. As you know, with uh, shrimp's production, there's a lot of diseases around. White spot has been a big issue. A drop of production from 12,000 tons to around 3,000 tons uh, per year. And uh, second one is marine spatial planning. It's not very well developed but lead to conflicts uh, between different uh, users of the same resources. There's a lack of knowledge transfer. We will see this in uh, all three different countries, lack of knowledge from scientists to community, and also a lack of knowledge in terms of aquaculture. The activities mainly focus on non-direct edible product, but is not contributing directly to food uh, security, but actual uh, activities around agriculture. And then uh, one of the big problems for Madagascar is most of the aqua feed are imported instead of being uh, produced locally. There's a lack of know-how on production of aqua feed. Their production system has poor performance, um, again, because there's a lack of knowledge. And uh, there's an incomplete control of, of the different breeding techniques. These are the different factors that is uh, stopping uh, further development of mariculture in Madagascar. There's also a lack of good quality food manufacturing infrastructure, high production costs. I think here there's a problem in terms of a species we are choosing. And there's low level of communication between stakeholders, lack of technical and financial means, inadequate equipment and facilities for research in aquaculture. Research leads to innovation, and this is something which is really missing in, in, in Madagascar. And there's no development plan for alternative species uh, uh, for, for aquaculture. Commercial aquaculture is highly dependent on demand for price imposed by the importer. Here, we would like the government to step in and start uh, tempering these uh, fluctuation in price. And lack of support to vulnerable farmers, uh, that is uh, Madagascar, most of aquaculture, mainly in the coastal region, is, is, uh, needs community-based actions and, and uh, some of these vulnerable farmers are facing the lack of funds, uh, acquisition of materials, uh, feeds, and, 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 and fingerlings. The opportunities, however, in Madagascar is very recently there has been creation of Ministry of Fisheries and the Economy. Uh, as you probably know, our colleagues, Kobe is now the Minister for um, Blue Economy and Fisheries in Madagascar, which is a very good thing. Ongoing process to elaborate strategic orientation to develop blue economy in Madagascar. Aquaculture is the future, they know that, which is good, both marine and freshwater. Um, there's opportunities for the elaboration of national strategy, strategic plan for the development of aquaculture. Existing project with 
Swire Fish 2, which is uh, funded by World Bank. And there is also development of seaweed farming and over aquaculture activities such as sea cucumber and crab farming. We are getting support from different partners, FAO, UNDP, GIZ, and UE, and development of research uh, activities. We are now developing some research centers like the CNRO. And uh, our existing uh, regional network is also helping for governance and technical exchange, while Eugen and YMS are part of it. And there are support from non state actors too. In terms of perspective and uh, recommendation to uh, decision makers, uh, there is a need for an increased uh, production up to 5% annually, improvement of research and development, involvement of youth, but the gender inequality uh, Madagascar is facing in terms of uh, mariculture, Prof professionalization of aquaculture activities, that is, do not consider aquaculture as an alternative uh, activities anymore. It is a real um, economic uh, sector, development of guidelines for small scale uh, farmers. Um, yeah, community based aquaculture needs certain support, and the small scale farmers do not have it at the moment. And identification and mapping of suitable sites was to uh, decrease the conflicts between the different uh, users of the same resources, creation of training centers to facilitate knowledge and sensitization of fishermen community to shift from fisheries to aquaculture. We'll see more, more or less the same thing in, uh, in, in Mauritius too. So Mauritius, like uh, many small island development state is heavily dependent on importation of foodstuff, as I mentioned before. Over a year ago, Mauritius didn't have any problem with food uh, security. However, when COVID came, we faced some really big issues because of a shortage in supply of labor, tightening of international trade, which, uh, which uh, uh, relates to uh, the price of uh, food stuff in Mauritius start increasing. And there is a lack of certain product uh, because uh, the shipping has been affected. So this pandemic has highlight, highlighted how vulnerable the country is due to its excessive dependence on imports. The country is in need of a more resilient food production system that is a decentralized one that reduces the distances between the production and to fall. The sources of aquatic protein in Mauritius, like many SIDS, we are heavily dependent on marine resources. We do have around 2.3 million square kilometer of EEZ around, which is at the moment really, really not, not exploited at all. The contribution of aquatic protein to the local diet is, as I said, around 20 to 23 percent, uh, 20 to 23 kilo per per capita. The inshore fisheries mainly produce local reef fish, but they are heavily exploited in Mauritius. Overfishing has seen a marked increase importation of frozen food from Madagascar and over Southeast Asian countries. We actually import over 75% of, of our seafood for local consumption and for a uh, small island development state, this is a, I would say, it's real shame. And now, uh, the government has started putting some uh, restriction. They have put a ban on importation of certain type of fish, just to uh, a kind of strategy put forward to promote local food production and sales. The contribution of aquaculture to food security and job creation. Aquaculture stands as a good candidate to help a country to build its food production resili resi resiliency. The small scale aquaculture, aquaculture sector in Mauritius is very much un underdeveloped. And there are opportunities now to, uh, to develop that sector. According to the latest statistics, the VAT sector employs around 29,000 people. And there's a big, big gap or gender gap. Only around 4% of women are employed. The aquaculture sector in itself employs 129 persons only, 18 of them are women. And uh, I would say these 129 people who are employed in aquaculture, around 80% are from one commercial company. We have only one commercial com company in the, in the country. What is hindering the development of aquaculture in, uh, in the country? Lack of access to land. There's a lot of conflicts between the tourism industry and real estate development. All the coastal uh, lands are, are very high value and, and difficult to, uh, to have access to develop uh, aquacultures, lack of technical knowledge, although Mauritius has a lot of skilled labor, 
the knowledge in terms of farming uh, of the sea of uh, mariculture and aquaculture is, is lacking. Traditional emotion are used to land farming, but not the sea. So we need more training in this, uh, in this stage, in, in this section. There's a problem of a legal framework also. There's a general ineffective governance in the fishery sector and aquaculture subsector in the country. There's a need for the government to recognize aquaculture subsector as an economic sector in itself and include it in, into the current fisheries regulation. And also there's a need to adopt an ecosystem approach to aquaculture, have a more holistic approach for aquaculture development in Mauritius. As I mentioned before, there are conflict uh, between stakeholders using the same resources and tourism industry versus food production. In 2018, this conflict has reached a level where government has banned any further development in the lagoons because the lagoons were used for all tourism activities. And luckily, or well, I would say luckily, I would say one thing, thanks to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, they have realized that we, start, we need to start producing food and they have lifted this ban or in process of lifting it. We have security issues because uh, resources at sea are, tend to be considered as common uh, resources. So it's become more challenging to delimit uh, uh, areas at sea. If it is on land, you can fence it. At sea, it's more difficult. And there's a lack of general lack of trust in aquaculture activities in Mauritius. More, many people think that uh, you know, it is uh, considered as a polluting activity. But uh, if we choose the right species and the right system, such as integrated multi-profit aquaculture, it shouldn't be an issue. The main opportunities to aquaculture development in Mauritius is we have 13 marine concession inside and outside the lagoon has been dedicated for our mariculture and aquaculture. In addition, we that, we have 2.3 million square kilometers of EZ. Uh, I realize that none or majority of it cannot be used for aquaculture. But we do have a lot of outer islands like Saint Brandon, Agalega, where we can develop around these islands agriculture. Mauritius is surrounded by pristine water quality, and I think this is a plus when we start uh, producing a uh, product which is, uh, you know, in good water quality, disease free, and eventually we can look for certain types of labeling, such, such as the ESC. And uh, Mauritius is also phasing out the sugarcane production. And there has been now a lot of land masses on the coast, which is uh, close to water, which is being freed and, and could, we could have access to, to this land if the government you know, step in and start putting some restriction on, uh, on, on tourism and, and real estate development. The country has access to skilled labor, which is, which is, as I mentioned, good, although we still need training, but this training needs to start from very, very uh, early start in secondary school even. Mauritius has now a series of policies and schemes for the Economic Development Board, which is a hub to attract foreign investment in the country. For example, we have tax holidays, VAT and duty exemption, air freight rebate on chilled and fresh uh, seafood uh, products. In addition, the country has a stable political system and create a safe environment for foreign investment. The island has also a well-established free port system that serves as a duty free logistic distribution and marketing hub for the region. So we have an established market for a seafood product. For example, we have established market with EU, which is not very easy to, to get. I forgot to, to put uh, US on that. We do have uh, you know, US market also, Asian and, and other African countries. We are now looking, uh, we are developing a trade relationship with China. I think we have seal the, 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 the deal uh, early this year, so that's done. And we are looking for a uh, trade relationship with uh, Russia, South Korea, and Brazil. And the island has also a well-established support system for the development of uh, small to medium enterprise. So this has been an engine for the economic uh, growth in Mauritius. As SME contributes to around 40% of the GDP and 55% of the total employment. And aquaculture being a business, we should tap into that, uh, uh, that uh, support system. And more recently, a few months ago, Mauritius is uh, looking into developing a national aquatic animal health strategy. Some recommendations for decision makers, we need to recognize aquaculture as a potential sector, uh, economic sector to boost uh, the blue economic growth promote horizontally integrated aquaculture companies instead of vertically integrated companies, 
which often has a much bigger impact on the ecosystem. Unfortunately, Alberta Mind, the government is going to big vertically integrated companies, and we should change that and look into more development of more SMEs into agriculture. Put in place an agriculture development plan. We do not have one for a country, and this is a big issue. And, and use the SME motion should act as a forefront in enabling, enabling the aquaculture se sector development. For example, we should break down the value chain and allow different SMEs to take over part of the value chain. For example, like companies specialize in hatch production, another one in grow out, another one in processing and marketing. And also what is lacking using some certain decision-making tools for which species and system we should use uh, for aquaculture. I have done one, for example, one I've used, which is the prioritization and diagnostic matrix. So what is this? Um, look at all the benefits and feasibility of certain uh, types of aquaculture in Mauritius. In terms of benefit, we look at the economic, socioeconomic uh, benefits and also the capacity building. In terms of feasibility, I've looked into economic, technical, biological, social feasibilities, governance, and risk. And I asked, you know, different question and send this question to different stakeholders. And they score it uh, from zero, one, two, and three, as you can hear. And I've plotted the different, for example, here is for species. And you will notice that there are different species plot on this graph. And, and I've highlighted two, which is really uh, interesting. When it comes to red hybrid tilapia, which is a fresh water, the feasibility is good. The benefit is very low because Mauritius doesn't eat freshwater species. But our company now is it, using this species because it's a species of tilapia which can uh, hold very high salinity. And we are running it into marine strain and the benefit and feasibility become very high. These are the types of aquaculture we should be looking. Sea cucumber, which is an unfed species, which is good. And uh, this type of decision-making tools is lacking and is greatly needed in the country. In terms of Kenya, in Kenya, we put insecurity trend is worrying as the population is rapidly increasing against an annually declining arable land per capita and consequences increase in food prices. Aquaculture has so far been recognized an important opportunity to enhance food, household food security in developing countries. There is evidence of a contribution of aquaculture to nutritional security for direct fish consumption and income stability among vulnerable groups for involvement in aquaculture value chains uh, linkages. Kenya you know, has a favorable climate, coupled with the minimum requirement for space and labor for fish management, provide a viable opportunity for aquaculture. Kenya has done a lot in terms of, uh, of uh, inland uh, farming activities. We have, we have, uh, we have uh, a, um, a national uh, program for freshwater aquaculture, which has worked very well, uh, has boosted the production. I think it was from around 7,000 uh, metric ton in 2007 to up to 25,000 uh, currently, so it's which, which works. You know? This aquaculture sector, as I uh, mentioned, is dominated by freshwater, but there's a need for it a change, a paradigm shift to towards marine aquaculture. Mariculture in Kenya has made some progress over the past decade for the development of simple, innovative technologies, such as construction of inexpensive ponds, pens, and cages. The culture species that need limited water management and um, low quality uh, food or low uh, protein intake, for example, milkfish, mullet, mud crabs, and, 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 and prawn. The factors that hinder the mariculture development in Kenya, based on here again, lack of knowledge or biology of cultured species, unreliable funding, conflicting government policies, lack of capital investment, lack of access to international markets, limited technology expertise, and lack of data. We, we don't have uh, no production statistics, and as you know, we need data to be able to move uh, forward. The main opportunities, as I mentioned before, were in 2009, the government funded the National Farming Program, but this is mainly for freshwater. This was aimed at stimulating economic development, foster economic recovery, and create employment and alleviation uh, of poverty. Even though there's a potential for fish farming in Kenya, there's no long-term plan for aquaculture, and this makes it difficult 
to quantify fish production targets. The development and wider adoption of aquaculture can be seen as a significant basis for improving household food security and uh, over needed welfare. The support of a mix of small scale and large scale aquaculture accelerated roles in promoting macroeconomic growth. And we say need for deeper analysis is needed before casual linkages can be inferred and poverty and food security benefits of aquaculture can be claimed. So very recommendation for to decision makers in Kenya is there is a need for more public and private investment, appropriate national aquaculture policies. There's a need for a holistic approach to, uh, to aquaculture linked to rural development. And promoting and increasing aquaculture productivity will not only contribute towards increased production of nutritious food to reduce food security, but will also allow a country to produce a surplus for export. And we need, we need uh, more empirical evidence should be collected on varied, varied opportunities of aquaculture in terms of employment, food consumption, and, and food security in, in general. So to conclude, uh, what I'll try to do is find some of the common factors that hinder the development, uh, which really needs to be, to be looked into uh, in, in priority. And here, uh, I would hope that, you know, we could use the platform of Wyogens to, to exchange knowledge to do some transfer. As I mentioned, with a lack of strategic aquaculture development plan. I think Madagascar is developing one. I'm not sure about Kenya and Mauritius, we don't have one. And this plan it should clearly state the priority intervention areas, strategies, objectives, key performance indicators, and targeted output. And ideally, it should adopt an ecosystem approach to aquaculture, link the development plan to proper national aquaculture policies. We hope this will be done. Lack of technical knowledge, informing and techniques in aquaculture business development. And here, why Eugene can, can intervene, I'm, I hope so in terms of transfer of know-how. For example, Mauritians will learn a lot from, from people in Madagascar in terms of you know, uh, aquaculture of mud crabs and seaweed and, and, and sea cucumber. And once we've got this knowledge locally, there is a lack of extension services. And this uh, is seen in Mauritius and all three different countries. We tend to do research, we tend to do innovation, but we do not extend it towards the local communities. communities. Private investors do not have access to funds. Uh, aquaculture is still considered as a risky business. We need more in incentives from the government, grant, tax incentives, low interest rate, et cetera. A loan with low interest rate. And uh, community-based activities still uh, difficult to take up due to a lack of support from institution. And reduce post-harvest handling issues, improve value addition and direct access to market. These are factors that we need to work on. And species model are not adequate for community-based activities. We need to find better models such as extractive species, unfed ones, which, are, which produce, which have a low production cost. Okay, please, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would like to thank you know, the contribution, contributors to this, uh, you know, this study, uh, Pobea, and Caroline, and Stephanie. And also thank you, uh, Warijan, for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, Dev, for this really uh, uh, comprehensive overview of, of your findings from the three countries. Um, and thanks for bringing Wyogen in. Uh, I think there's great opportunity um, um, for a South South uh, exchange on knowledge. Yes, I think there, yeah, as you I pointed out so. yourself. Um, mm. And we're happy to support you if, uh, I mean, Pobert is part of our network and um, we are, if you want to set up something, a small workshop or some, just let us know, get in touch and I'm sure we can uh, work on something. Um, is there something like this going on, just as a follow-up question, because it fits so well now. Um, is there uh, interest already in a South-South uh, transfer of or exchange of knowledge um, that you worked on already? Uh, not not from uh, from my uh, my knowledge when I was working at the ministry, I initiated uh, some, mm -hmm. and and my contract has is finished now, so I don't know who has take take over from uh, 
my uh, initiatives. I don't think there is uh, right at the moment, but uh, as you know, Kobe is now the Minister for Blue Economy. There are exchanges. I'm hoping we can do we can do there, and we could use him as an you know, as an NG as a startup to to start getting uh, these. Uh, next week, I'm uh, receiving some uh, some uh, some of the uh, developers of C Cucumber Aquaculture from Madagascar in Mauritius, and I hope there there will be certain uh, you know uh, between private companies. Uh, I'm now into the private uh, uh, sector. Uh, we could exchange, we could do some exchanges, and we are hoping to get some exchanges between EU too. So, uh, so this will help. Uh, and, and I think, I think my journey is great for that because uh, when I was reviewing this, I could see, you know, although Mauritius is considered as a, you know, a developer or whatever type of countries, uh, we, we are mainly focused here in Mauritius for us to develop aquaculture, it's mainly in terms of developing small SMEs, small medium enterprise, mm -hmm. while Madagascar and Kenya is mainly community-based actions uh, to develop. We can see these are two different things, but I don't think so because I think in Mauritius we have uh, we, we could we could do you know uh, SME in terms of seaweed production. When we look at around, there's no knowledge in it, and uh, look, going to Madagascar and acquiring knowledge in it will be great, and and we have space to do that. Uh, the same thing, uh, you know. Uh, Madagascar want to develop SMEs, come to Mauritius. We've got very good infrastructure in place, very good uh, support system, which has been working. When you see uh, SME uh, is contributing to 40% of a GDP, it's a big thing. And, and, and they want this to increase up to 55% in the next 10 years. True. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that insight. And please get in touch if you want our assistance in setting some exchanges yeah, we'll up. Do. Um, Thank you. Uh, next on the list, um, since the two other speakers are still no-shows, would be Gladys, I think. Is that right? Yes, um, I can share my screen. If you want, sure, go ahead. All right, give me a minute. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So this uh, afternoon, I'll be giving you a short uh, overview of a project that we have been undertaking um, here in the Wea region. It's on enabling sustainable exploitation of the coastal tuna species. And here we're focusing on Kawakawa and Skipjack. So this is a collaboration uh, with, between many institutions. As you can see on the screen, we have Rhodes University, we have Sokoine University, we have Kempfree, we have IP from Mozambique, we have Tafiri from Tanzania, and we have uh, Abarist with University from the UK. Just a bit of a background, uh, the Indian Ocean represents the world's second largest tuna producing region, and it lands about 920 metric tons of tuna annually. This accounts for 20 to 24% of the world, ocean, the world market, and it's, uh, valued at 2.3 billion US dollars, representing about 16% of the world's tuna industry. In the Indian Ocean, tuna fisheries have become increasingly important. Uh, as you're aware, most of the nations are aspiring to expand their national fleets, and this is mainly towards harnessing the blue economy. Uh, the tuna species that we're studying as mentioned, is skipjack, which is Katsuanis pelamis, and then Kawakawa, which is Euthenius affinis. So skipjack is one of the tropical tuna species, one of the principal market species globally, and it's captured by industrial and artisanal fisheries, whereas Kawakawa is mainly uh, exploited by artisanal fishers. And the metric tonnage is about 500, over 547,000 tons. Uh, that was a tonnage, uh, exploited in the Indian Ocean in 2019, whereas for Affinis, it was around 173,000 tons. And both uh, species under IOTC are still, uh, the stocks are still healthy and can be uh, exploited. Oh, sorry. Am I being seen on the video? Thank you, sorry about that, okay. Uh, the, I think the video is interfering with my 
the current patch. You can just turn it off if you want, yeah. if it makes it yeah, easier. I, think I, can't, uh, I can't do both. Okay. Are you seeing the slides now? Yeah. The Everything movement, right. uh, the new slide, okay. Yeah. So the objectives, we have three objectives. Um, the first one is looking at the, the genetic connectivity uh, between uh, the countries that we're studying. We're trying to do a genome-wide uh, assessment of uh, the genetic diversity, looking at the, the stock structure. The second objective is to, to investigate the influence of oceanographic factors on uh, distribution, spawning patterns, genetic structure, and also the catches. And then the third objective is to conduct a value chain analysis across the countries, just to understand the economic uh, uh, uses and value of, of these two species. Now, due to uh, challenges that we've had uh, with COVID-19, we are a bit behind, but I'll just be giving you some highlights of, of the research findings that we have so far as we continue with the, with the study. So with the objective one on the genetic analysis, we have uh, two sites in Kenya, two sites in Tanzania. In Mozambique, we have one site, and then we have outgroups in Seychelles and Goa in India. And then for the skipjack, again, two sites in Kenya, one in Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa, two sites, and then output uh, countries is Seychelles and Sri Lanka. So, so far we have uh, collected uh, genetic samples. They're currently at uh, Aberystwyth University where the DNA has been extracted. So the genetic sequencing is ongoing and we're hoping to um, uh, uh, see uh, the kind of results we, we, that we'll, we'll get uh, very soon as the work is uh, ongoing. Um, objective two and three, we are also characterizing uh, the, the small scale tuna fishery, which is our focus. And this objective um, uh, overlaps. This, uh, the characterization of the fishery is an uh, overlap between objective two and three, looking at uh, the fishery itself and uh, the seasonality of the catches. And then again, looking at uh, aspects of the value chain through the catch, catch analysis. So here on this screen, I have um, the gear types that are targeting Skipjack and Kawakawa in Kenya. We've been able to determine that there are about eight, eight gears that are targeting. Um, among these gears, all of them are catching tuna. But as you can see on the left, um, some gears are, are catching, uh, the composition of some gears is much uh, uh, focused on tuna compared to others. Others are having a mixed species of uh, other, other pelagics and uh, demersals. But when, when we look at uh, the two species, um, we find that uh, Kawakawa is uh, being caught by all the gear types, high diversity of gears, but the three main gears is ringnet, reef seine, and drifting gillnet. And you can see there about Ringnet is catching quite a high abundance. Ringnet and reef seines, about 350 kilos uh, per trip. For reef seines, around 276 kilos per trip. So that's very, very high. For, for, for Palamis, um, we found that uh, about four gears were capturing uh, this species. And the, high, the gear that is mainly catching is the drifting gillnet. Uh, Kawakawa is being caught um, about 31.5% of the total landings uh, are Kawakawa, whereas for, for skipjack, only 4% of the total landings were skipjack. In terms of catch composition, this uh, just shows you uh, how the, the species dominate in the different gear types. You can see for ring for ringnet and reef seines uh, and set gill nets, you, you see uh, uh, Kawakawa um, being uh, caught highest. Whereas if you look at uh, the other gears, you find that they're catching very high diversity of, 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 of species. Now in terms of size selectivity, what we're able to see across the countries, if you look on your right, you're seeing uh, skipjack, the size selectivity is relatively similar 
but when, when we look at Kawakawa, we're seeing that uh, for Kenya and Tanzania, where Kawakawa is being caught, the selectivity for Kenya and Tanzania is quite similar. But uh, for Mozambique, they're catching very, very small uh, Kawakawa. And that is because of the gear types that are being used. They're actually using small seine nets and beach seines. So they are uh, really impacting on the, on the juvenile sizes. And this screen just shows you the, the size ranges uh, of the two species across the different countries. Um, on, your, on, your, on your left, you can see that most of the countries are catching uh, uh, individuals that are larger than the size at maturity. Actually, all the countries, if you look. And then on the right, you can see the maturity composition. And you can see therefore Kenya and Tanzania were mainly catching uh, mature fish, 75 to 79% of the catch is mature fish. Whereas in Mo Mozambique, 90% of the catch is immature fish. And the same trend we're seeing for skipjack um, with South Africa catching 70% uh, uh, immature fish. Now, with regards to mean sizes, uh, we're comparing between uh, the different gears that are catching. We're able to observe that drifting gill nets are catching the largest individuals of uh, Kawakawa, whereas for skipjack, um, drifting gill nets and monofilament gill nets are catching relatively similar sizes, whereas uh, monofilament gill nets are catching very small or the smallest sizes, around 42 centimeters. However, when we looked at the mean sizes between seasons and we tried to compare this statistically, we did not see any significant difference. So there seems to be no, no uh, significant change in sizes uh, across the seasons. Now with regards to seasonality and catch rates, uh, we're able to determine uh, for Kawakawa, we're seeing peaks in January and April. And then for skipjack, there was a, we see peaks uh, between December and, and February. So that's when uh, the peak season is occurring in terms of catch rates. And all this information that we have collected, we shall be trying to understand how the oceanographic uh, features are influencing them, influencing the catches, influencing the genetic connectivity. And uh, you can see there on, on the left, uh, from December to February, you're seeing quite uh, major action going on compared to between uh, May and September. So these ocean, oceanic fronts are likely to be contributing a lot to uh, the dynamics of the catches that we're having. We'll also be trying to pinpoint uh, hotspots of, of tuna abundance uh, in upwelling zones, because upwelling zones also do contribute to the, to the population parameters that we are recording. So this also will be ongoing work. Uh, under the value chain, I'll just give uh, some information on the market supply. So we've undertaken a value chain analysis very recently and the data is still being analyzed, but these are just some of the uh, highlights. Uh, if we look at the seasonality based on uh, uh, what the traders and wholesalers experience in terms of the market supply. For Kenya, we were seeing, um, they reported uh, their high season to be between October and December. Whereas for Mozambique, the high season was in January to March. And then for Tanzania, the high season was in February to, to April. So we found that quite interesting and we're trying to see how it correlates with the catch, catch dynamics. We're also trying to understand the supply chain. So this is a, a supply chain that we are observing uh, between Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, mainly this is a, a domestic uh, fishery. So all the fish is, is, is being consumed locally and the catches are either going, slight, some catches are going for home consumption. Um, some catches going to fish processors uh, who are the, the, fry, the, the mama karangas or the women who fry the fish by the beaches for sale. Most of the catch is going to the, to the fish traders and boat owners, as you can see on, on, on the right, 74% of the fish is bought by the boat owners and investors. So they own the boats and uh, therefore they own the catches and uh, 
they dominate um, the purchasing. Whereas in Tanzania, we saw a slight difference where uh, the, the fish is, going, uh, is being uh, purchased uh, mainly by the households. So 43% was going to the, straight to, the, to be consumed by the households. And then about 37% going to the traders. So you can see there's slight difference in the value chains. Now, with uh, recreational fisheries, this is a unique fishery that we're looking at in South Africa, trying to understand how uh, this fishery exploits the two species. Uh, what is, uh, what we have to note is that cow cow is only, is mainly being caught uh, in the east coast of South Africa, whereas skipjack is being caught um, throughout the coastline. And uh, during our questionnaire survey, we, we did ask uh, which species uh, they target uh, among the respondents uh, who are anglers, recreational anglers, commercial anglers, and charter operators. And uh, what we observed is that when asked the question, what species do you target, uh, quite a big uh, percentage said they do not target any of the species, so they're not really uh, capturing these small species. But a small percentage did say that they target uh, skipjack, about 28%, and another small percentage said that they do target both uh, species. But with regards to the catch composition, um, about 43% of the respondents said they, they catch uh, skipjack. Um, about 19 uh, said they mostly catch uh, skipjack, whereas um, those who mostly caught kawakawa were 16%. Um, we, if we look at the, the, the kilos that are being caught, um, skipjack about 22.3 kilos, and this constitutes about 44% of the total catch, whereas for kawakawa about 32 kilos per trip, and that constitutes about 47% of the total catch. So this gives us a, 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 a sneak peek on uh, what is happening with the recreational fishery in South Africa, targeting the two species. And uh, we, we are continuing with our data analysis. Uh, we have some mil milestones we're yet to achieve uh, doing the genetic connectivity analyze, analysis, finalizing on our value, value chain analysis. And also we do have uh, PhD and MSc students attached who uh, we hope will be completing their studies by the year December, 2022. I'll end my presentation there and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really nice talk. Um, thanks for sharing all that uh, wealth of knowledge. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Seems like not so far. I have one. Um, during your talk, I realized that uh, you said that in some countries there's a very high percentage of undersized uh, fish that have not read yet reproduced. Is anything done to to try to prevent that or are there measures in place? Um, I will not be able to answer that because that is a, that is a, an issue that is uh, pertaining Mozambique, but I may be able to uh, consult and come back with that answer. Okay, nice. Yeah, yes. Um, and um, if I just may continue, <laughs> I'm not a fishery scientist, but it was really interesting to see. Um, there was like slight shifts in in the peak catches. So is that also a transition of seasons uh, yes. among the coast um, in the channel? Yeah, we're suspecting it, there's a strong influence of of, of the oceanographic uh, features as as the monsoons change. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that uh, as we do the genetic analysis, we'll be able to really come up with a, a clear uh, answer on that. But definitely it's an influence of okay. seasonality, yes. Cool, thanks a lot, really interesting. Um, if there are no other questions from the audience, we are in a very lucky position, if I see correctly, that we are actually a bit early. <laughs> um, so I will just share, there will be the early career researcher break coming up soon. So a facilitated lunch break to get together 
have a coffee and uh, exchange. Um, but we are a bit early, so you can start stretching your legs already, grab something to eat and um, join the link for the next session afterwards. It was a pleasure exchanging with you. Um, thanks for the speakers for this nice uh, interactions. And we're looking forward to hearing from you in the future. Please stay connected to the network. So thanks, everybody. And yeah, you can proceed to the next room already or stick around here a bit until you move on to the next one, which will start at in about eight minutes. So we saved some time. See you okay. around. Thanks.